green flag is about to fall on the biggest and boldest year in the history of the Indy Racing League. Major manufacturers like Toyota and Honda have switched codes and joined the IRL. With them, top teams and star drivers like Britain's own Dario Franchitti have moved too. A cracking 2003 season is in prospect. This is the opening round from the Homestead Miami Speedway. Hello and welcome to a brand new season of American Motor Racing here on Sky Sports. We've been bringing you the Indy Racing League since that faltering start back in 1996. But now the league has definitely come of age. It's without question America's number one single-seater series. And today we're at the Homestead Miami Speedway, which is a few miles southwest of Miami. And you can expect a titanic battle with 18 cars already lapping within a second of each other in qualifying. Here are the headlines. Andretti Green Racing fill the front row with Tony Kanaan inching out team boss Michael Andretti. But for many, the qualifying speed of double champion and double Miami winner Sam Hornish Jr. is the surprise. The Chevy engine was said to be far behind Honda and Toyota in the power stakes, but he outqualifies the best Toyota-powered car of double Indy 500 winner Helio Castro Neves. And there was an unhappy qualifying session for Edinburgh's Dario Franchitti in the third green team Delara. He lines up on row four. So a great deal to talk about with me is one of our regular pundits, Christopher Tate. And like several of the drivers, Christopher has moved teams too. He's now the European Chief Executive of Elan Motorsport Technologies, who build the G-Force chassis, which are racing in IRL this weekend. Well, we'll be hearing a lot more from Christopher later in the programme, of course, over the next two hours or so. But now we can join another familiar face at trackside, is Lee Diffie, to bring us right up to date. Well, Keith, it's a very different looking IRL IndyCar series to the one we saw last year. And of course, the big talking point is that this weekend marks the entry to the series for Japanese automotive giants Toyota and Honda. Now, Toyota have invested heavily in this project, and that's reflected in the car count on the grid. Ten Toyotas versus six Chevrolets and only five Hondas. Now, to add to that manufacturer diversity, we've seen six drivers make the transition from kart to the IRL series. Most notably, of course, Michael Andretti and 1998 champ. Kenny Brack who rejoins Team Rahal and they're in a Honda. That'll be one to watch. It's an interesting situation. Now of course it wouldn't be an open wheeler show on Sky without talking about our favourite Dario Franchitti. Dario is one of those six who's made the transition. He's with his good buddy Tony Kanaan at the new Andretti Green Racing and so far he's enjoying this new challenge. Dario, new season, new challenge. How's it all going? Yeah, so far so good. We've had um, a couple of test days, I think eight days. Never feels enough but we're still, uh, we're still doing last minute changes. With only 45 minute sessions here as well, it's, uh, it's pretty frantic in the middle. Tell us about these cars, I'm sure everyone at home wants to ask you the same question. What are they like to drive? Is there a huge difference? There is a big difference. A big difference from what I'm used to. There's also a big difference to what I drove at Indianapolis last year. I really managed to cut down the weight in the rear of the car, get the engine a lot lower, so you really feel that there's a lot more response. And, uh, you know, with Honda and Toyota and the championship, the power levels will keep going up every week, so uh, they're getting quicker and quicker all the time. So far in, in pre season testing, it's like a pretty square fight, Honda versus Toyota. Chevys are a little bit slow. Is it going to stay that way for the season? I think Chevy are working hard to keep up. Um, and I'm sure they will have, you know, they'll, they'll keep the pressure on, but right now it does, does appear that the Honda's have an advantage with Toyota, and um, you know, as you know, those guys really want to win badly. And the Japanese guys are just pushing each other all the time. Work to do then for Dario. The start of the race is now just a few seconds away, so let's join our commentary team at trackside, Larry Rice and Gary Lee. Long front straightaway bank, some three degrees into the six degree banking of the turns. And there is a look at uh, Scott Dixon driving for Chip Ganassi. In the target entry, he'll be starting back in 12th position. Yeah, this young man has high hopes. He's from a road racing background, but very fast on the ovals. Felipe Giafoni won a race last year. He'll be starting 15th, driving for Mo Nunn in the Hollywood car. Also a former Rookie of the Year in this uh, series a couple of years back. And there is Al Unser Jr. starting back in 11th position, driving one of the two Kelly entries. He's teaming with Scott Sharp for Team Kelly. And there's a look at Buddy Rice driving for Eddie Cheever, the Red Bull racing entry. Eddie uh, will drive the Indianapolis 500 and maybe one race before that, then says he may call it a career as a driver and uh, maintain the ownership. There's a look at the uh, Andretti Green team up in front. Michael Andretti, at the age of 40, says that he'll race four races this season, make the Indianapolis 500 his last song. So 
Tony Kanaan, his teammate on the pole, will bring them by. You see Sam Hornish back there in that yellow Pennzoil Panther team starting third alongside Elio castro -Nevitz. The pace car is off the track. We're about to go green. 200 laps. A drag race, and look on the outside. castro -Nevitz tries to make it three wide. And this groove is very narrow this early in the racetrack, and look at Andretti takes the point, and here comes castro -Nevitz. Tony Kanaan drops from the front row to third position. Tony Kanaan said it's too early for this nonsense. I'm going to let these guys go. And you have Jill DeFerrin up there running in fifth position. So the uh, Andretti Green team, the uh, Penso, or the uh, Penske team, as they start to string out here on this first circuit. Michael Andretti, who at the age of 40 says now he's going to call it a career. He has won twice on this racetrack as well. So he is sandwiched. And he's a guy who. Uh, really thinks he has something to prove you know he wants to go out with a, a flash you know he really he would like to be leading the points he'd like to win Indianapolis and go out on top well every place he goes the question is if you are leading the points after Indianapolis will you retire and consistently he has said hey what a great way to go out so right now he leads the race well he picked three racetracks that he's been at before he picked this racetrack Phoenix Japan and Indianapolis four racetrack where he has raced to finish out his career. So he's very comfortable, obviously very fast here right now. Riding along with Scott Sharp, and the yellow is oh. out in a crash already. That is Scott Mayer out of Franklin, Wisconsin, one of the uh, three rookies in the race. In the bank one entry for PDM Racing, and he brings out an early yellow. Well, that's a tough break for PDM Racing. They've been working with Scott Mayer now for quite some time, trying to get him ready to go IndyCar Racing, Indy, in this IndyCar Racing Series. So he's been, uh, He's been working a long time for, towards his debut. He didn't get to qualify and uh, had to start on the tag, tag the field at the back, but obviously didn't make it too far into the field. So Michael Andretti continues to lead the first yellow early on for uh, Scott Mayer. He drives the uh, Chevrolet powered Delora in the field today. We do have 16 Delora chassis and five G-Force chassis. Ten are powered by Toyotas, five by Hondas, and six by Chevrolets. Now, wind was going to be a factor here, Larry. The track is very hot compared to what it was in preseason testing, and the drivers had complained about the winds. This is a newcomer, a rookie. Uh, we're not sure if the wind played a role in this particular crash. Well, we're not, but uh, and when you come to a place like, uh, like this here at Miami, it's a very tricky little racetrack. It's very flat, and the, the handling is extremely important on a race car. If you don't have things set up just right, and especially if you're a rookie, it uh, can cause you trouble. You can see right there the back end just got away from him. He that was right very up. early in the turn. Yes, it certainly was. He bit up there. He didn't hit the wall all that hard. He got it rode way down. But still, enough damage that that car's not going to continue here today. The one safety truck pulling out of the view there to your left is Dr. Henry Bach, who is the medical director for the Indy Racing League. And he has his own vehicle. He goes out there. Obviously, as Scott was not injured, a safety truck pulls out with... Uh, well, I think it's good to point out that the safety team here at the Indy Racing League Series is one of the... Oh, oh look at this. Maybe, from a, maybe he had some Yeah, I was going to say, from a different angle, it does look like maybe he did get touched a little bit. He was on the outside there. That was Hattori, I believe. And well, thankfully, we got that last uh, look at uh, what happened. And maybe Scott Mayer, despite the fact he had no qualifying at all um, and was chucked in the deep end here at uh, Miami, you've got to say... It looked like Hattori helped him on his way there. Yeah, I was about to start being horrible about poor old Scott Mayer, but he's really not had a lot of running and not a lot of reputation in the past either, Keith. So where he's come from, you know, to get out and have to do this first race, tough time, looks so he just made a rookie error. At the beginning of the turn, look closer, and it's our good old friend Shigeaki Hattori who's given him a nice tag and a punt into the wall, which is why he was throwing his helmet around in the shot we saw. He looked very, very unhappy, again. the youngster. Yeah. So therefore, Scott Mayer has uh, exited this race with the help of Shigi Hattori, but uh, we're going to take take a very short break while we're on a yellow flag. Racing is next. Welcome back to the 2003 Indy Racing League opening round. It's the Toyota Indy 300 from Miami Hampstead. And we have here, of course, Christopher Tate, a regular pundit here on Sky Sports. Now then, this year, while we are on this yellow that uh, Scott Mayer has uh, 
quite uh, given us at this particular point. We've got all new chassis and all new motors, all new rules this year for, for Indy Racing League. They've not left anything unturned, have they? No, I mean, this really is a completely different year, Keith, for the IRL, and I think it's going to be a great year for the fans too. The arrival of Toyota and Honda really changes the game completely, and Chevrolet have found it difficult over the winter. Good to see Sam Hornish, the reigning champion, with his Chevy engine up there quick, but you watch the way they're going to jump away from this restart. I bet you the four Honda cars get away quite quickly. The two Andretti green cars and the two Penske cars. Everybody said that the Chevy wasn't going to be the one to do the business, but certainly his qualifying position, Sam Hornish, what has he got that's over the rest of the Chevrolets there, Chris? Um, you wouldn't like to say too much about what that might be. It's very strange. Certainly they've looked as though they've been 40 or 50 brake horsepower down and the Chevys were very slow on the faster test in the west at Fontana a week or three ago. Um, well, that, now here we go. We're, we're going back, back under green now, so we'll go and back on lap 11, of course, here at Miami Homestead and just take a look at that. The 7-11 cars have got Elio Castroneves right between them. Let's cross back to the track live for our commentary team. Work on lap number nine. Oh, look yeah, at that. He had to get out of it. He had to get out of the throttle. He certainly did. When he did, he pushed up the racetrack. Canaan may be able to get around him. He's going to. It's Canaan very goes loose. To second. It's very loose up there on the top. Once he got high, he lost all his momentum. And look at the ferret on the inside. So look at Castro Nevitz loses two spots. He was challenging for the lead. He drops from second to fourth. Well, it was all brought about because he had to get on the brakes. He almost touched wheels with Andretti. He had to get on the brakes, and when he did, he lost all of his momentum, and with it, two spots. Dario Franchini back there in uh, fifth position. Scott Sharp has moved up. He's now in sixth, and Sam Hornish lost another spot on that restart. So the restarts are not very good to him right now. Sarah Torrey Bishop. is already three laps down, so uh, there may have been some uh, contact that did some damage to that car, and he's come to the attention of the A.J. Foyt crew, but he's three laps off the pace. There's Sarah Fisher. Yeah, she's away. She's running last on the racetrack right now, obviously having some sort of a problem, because she qualified very well. She was the second fastest Chevrolet in the field. 22 years of age. In fact, she and Scott Dixon share a birthday on October the uh, 4th. So she and Scott are actually the uh, third youngest drivers in the race. A.J. Point the fourth is 18. Uh, Thomas Schechter is 22, but his birthday is in, uh, he's a little younger than what uh, the other two are. And you can see that Kanan is uh, following right in the footsteps of his boss. Look at this, he's gonna challenge his boss as he goes to the inside. And I think Michael Andretti just let him go. Michael just pulled over and let him take the lead for whatever reason. Now that he's, he's going to lose second spot, he must have a problem. Michael Andretti's lost two spots in less than a half a lap, so obviously there's a problem there. Jill DeFerrin has gone around him. Here comes Castro Nevitz. He goes to the high side, not exactly where you think you're going to pass entering a corner. Boy, that's a, that's that's a place a that's gutsy, risky. That's a gutsy place to try to pass. That it's a, groove is so narrow right there. It's very narrow. It's a very risky up there because there are a lot of marbles up there. And your car's got to be handling extremely well to make the corner. These are very long corners. You're up on that outside for a long way around this racetrack. And uh, so you got to have your act together really well to go around the top of somebody up there. The race has had two leaders, both from the uh, Andretti Green team. And right now it's that team and the Penske team dominating the top four positions. Yeah, those four cars have put a little distance between themselves and the rest of the field as they've uh, they pulled out a little bit of a lead. But those four cars, uh, two of them with Toyotas, the two Penske cars with Toyotas, the two green cars with Hondas. And trying to find the best Chevrolet right now, and that would be Sam Hornish, and Hornish is back there in the uh, seventh position. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened to Michael Andretti, but he fell back two spots in a lap and a half, and now then all of a sudden he seems to be uh, back up to full chat. So I'm not sure exactly what happened to him, but he's certainly slowed down there for a little over half a lap. Let's establish, Larry, when we talk about the new engines, these are naturally aspirated, 3.5 liter, and they've actually changed the rev limiter 
lowered it. Right, it's down from 10,700 RPMs last year to 10,300 RPMs this year uh, to help the engines live a little bit. These engines are lighter, they have a lower center of gravity, it's helped the cars with handling, and obviously because the handling is better, the speeds are up. All new chassis, so there are a lot of differences in these cars and the things we've seen, the cars we've seen before. Well, along with Scott Sharp now, Sharp back in the fifth position, driving for Team Kelly. He also, uh, this is a team that they've had together for quite some time now. Also, Toyota Power. Scott Sharp crashed uh, in practice yesterday before qualifying, so uh, has not been a great weekend for him, but he came right back and qualified uh, right up front. So, uh, you know, a little good luck, a little bad luck. Well, Scott Mayer brought out the uh, first and only yellow of the afternoon on lap two when he crashed with, I think, some help from uh, Shigiaki Hattori, some slight contact that brought the rear of that car around. He's been checked out at the infield care center. He is okay, and hopefully momentarily uh, we'll have a, uh, a comment from Scott as we watch the race continue here at uh, the Homestead Miami car, Scott. Speedway. Well, I know there was definite contact. I just don't know if it was my fault or not. I went to make a pass on the outside of turn one from behind. I either pinched him down or he uh, came into me. We're happy to see you're okay. Thanks. Thank you. Jack Aroot having a visit with uh, the mayor after he was checked out as you ride back along with the Sam Hornish and the, uh, the best of the Chevrolet power plants this afternoon and the long back straightaway. He was the winner here last year and the year before after starting on the pole last year but right now he's out of the top six after 20 laps here in Miami. Tony Kadan, who uh, left the uh, Mo Nunn operation last year to join the Andretti Green team this year, qualified for the pole yesterday. Now is uh, showing the way. Yes, he is. There's a look there. at Giafoni. Now there is the Mo Nunn car, Giafoni, out there right now. He's uh, Giafoni had a great year last year. Didn't win, but he still had a great year. Finished up front most of the time. He started in 15th, currently running in 14th, so not much of a change. Uh, and you can see the field is getting spread out just a little bit as we ride along here with Felipe Giafoni, the Hollywood car. He's running back in uh, 13th spot right now. He's got a G Force with a Toyota. And of course, Mo Nunn's. Let's, uh, let's give him his due. You mentioned he hadn't won yet. Let's not forget about that win he had last year. Oh, that's season. right. He had uh, one Kentucky. win last year. You're right. So he did have one win. He, he had one until right at the end of the season, and everybody was uh, kind of all over him, and then he came up with that. Been very, very consistent exactly. up until that exactly. point. He just hadn't had that first win. Exactly. And you start thinking the psyche starts to work against a race driver. You know you're competitive, but when you can't quite make that next step up to victory lane, you start doubting yourself as, you, as you, you'll ever get that win. Well, and there were people doubting him, too, until that victory came along. As I remember, there were some people wondering what uh, what was going on and, and why he couldn't come up with a victory, but uh, he did so, and, and I, yeah, I apologize. I forgot about that. Well, a lot of people here. were wondering if by not winning a race, he would maintain that contract with Mo Nunn. Well, Mo Nunn is a guy who wants to win. There's no question about that. You've got to produce to be on his team. One of the target cars making a move to the inside. Scott. That's Fran Key. That's Fran Keaty. They're really going at it. Fran Keaty got past that. He goes back around him going into Schechter, turn one. Schechter in the, in the uh, target car for Chip Ganassi. Of course, uh, Thomas Schechter had three pole positions last year and a win and a volatile type uh, relationship with Eddie Cheever. So once again, Kanan continues to lead this thing in car 11. Happy to present live coverage of the Grand Prix of Miami. Gary Lee along with Larry Rice, the first of our 16 live events with the uh, Indy Racing League Indy Car Series and Tony Kanaan, who started from the pole position, relinquished the lead early on to his teammate Michael Andretti, but he came back around on lap 14 and has led since then. Yeah, he's coming up to lap Sarah Fisher right now as we go back to Sam Hornish, who is back in eighth spot. He's lost another spot to Thomas Schechter, so 
Sam Hornish not nearly as strong as he had hoped after a very good qualifying time. Well, if this race continues to go green, we're going to look for at least three pit stops. And of course, there may be some uh, handling problem with that car that they can rectify in the pit stop. I think we're going to see more than three pit stops just because of the tire wear. I don't think they're going to be able to run 50 full laps without a pit stop. Well, actually, the fuel load will last longer than the, the tires will last. Exactly. So Kanan and Andretti are teammates. DeFerrin and Castro Nevitz are teammates, and those four occupy the top four positions. And uh, we really should not be that surprised because uh, we expected uh, these two teams to offer a whole lot of competition to the likes of Sam Hornish for the title this year. And that's Scott Dixon following uh, Sam Hornish, and he's been picking up ground on him. So whatever the problem is with Sam Hornish's car, we were on board with him there for just a minute ago, and we couldn't hear any obvious engine problems. But uh, he is not uh, gaining ground, or he's losing ground, actually, uh, a little bit of time. Well, don't count Sam out, because in, in years past, we have seen Sam early on drop back, and we, we expect there is a problem and all of a sudden when the race is near the end he's back up toward the front well it's a very good team uh, they've been together for a long time the thing they're really fighting right now is the lack of horsepower and they really uh, you know Chevrolet's been working extremely hard they've been making some progress but I don't think they really have made all the progress they need to make they're going to try to get some new engine parts before Phoenix, and that should help them. Well, you know that Chevrolet is working real hard in R&D because uh, they've been the, the king engine on this circuit, and they don't like this competition for Honda and Toyota. So they're well, going to throw some more money into the R&D, and they'll come up with some good components. Well, one of the things that happened is they were concentrating on winning races last year, so they didn't have the manpower or the money to throw at this new engine last year. Remember, Toyota and Honda had all last season, they did nothing but test and work on their engines. Chevrolet did not have the luxury of doing that. They had an engine that they were racing last year in this series, so it made a big difference, and I think that's one of the reasons they were a little bit behind when they went to their first test this year. Is that the Epson car they're going by there? Couldn't tell. Yeah, I believe it is. That's the uh, Hattori car that uh, uh, is racing under the A.J. Foyt colors, at least through the Indianapolis 500. Then we expect that uh, Ayrton Dare will be back in the cockpit of that race car. Uh, I'm not sure that is. That's 27. That's Franchitti. That's Franchitti. He has really fallen off of the pace. He was up uh, stat you know, well, he was Franchitti battling. Franchitti is really backpedaling. Yeah, he's lost several spots here in the last couple of laps because he was challenging for fourth there at one time. Now we go back on board. The number nine car of uh, Scott Dixon. We take a look at Tony Kanaan leading 33 of 200 laps here in Miami. You're right along with Scott Dixon. Scott uh, as a teammate to Thomas Schechter on the uh, target Ganassi team. Back up in front. Tony Kanaan in the big gulp. 7-Eleven, number 11, continues to show the way. That is the yellow Pennzoil Panther entry of Sam Hornish right in front of him. You see the clouds start to build overhead. It's not uncommon here in the south of Florida that they get some rain in the afternoon. But let's hope that uh, that does not happen here and the weather is not a factor in this event. Second race out in three weeks. We will be in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. There's a look at Kenny Brack, former champion of this series. That is the Ray Hall, the team Ray Hall, which is co-owned by late night television host Dave Letterman. That's the pioneer entry. Bobby Ray Hall, a former champion of uh, IndyCar racing, a former winner of the Indianapolis 500. And of course, this driver, Kenny Breck, won the series title and the Indianapolis 500 while driving for A.J. Foyt. He's lost a couple of positions from the start of the race.
Breck, the Swede, who uh, enjoys playing the guitar. In fact, uh, it's not uncommon to see him uh, jamming with some other musicians. Uh, one of the uh, enjoyments off the racetrack for Kenny, the likable Swede, running the full season with uh, Ray Hall Racing here in the IndyCar Series with the Indy Racing League this year. Tony Kanaan continues to lead in the uh, Andretti Green stable. As that team and the Penske team right now occupy the first four positions. Back on board, oh, he goes by the uh, Hattori Epson entry to put him another lap down. And here's a pit stop for uh, the Red Bull car, the first of our uh, routine pit stops. Buddy Rice, a quick pit stop to the attention of the Cheever crew. Yeah, I'm sure that was such an uh, anticipated stop, still a little early. Yeah, it might be a little bit early, but I think, uh, you know, that when the handling goes away, sometimes you're smarter to come in, get new tires, and get back on the racetrack rather than waiting for that yellow flag because sometimes if you're running so slow on the racetrack, you're losing a half a second or so per lap, uh, it doesn't make any sense to stay out there and, and keep uh, struggling along. Come in and get new tires, change what you need to change, and go back out there and be competitive again. Only two leaders in this race. Michael Andretti from his outside pole starting position took the lead at the uh, start and led the first 13 circuits. And now Tony Kanaan has led since then. Scott Mayer brought out the yellow flag. We were under yellow for a total of six laps uh, on lap two. Some slight contact with the Tory put him in the fence. Here's a look at the uh, the Brazilian driver who now lives here in Miami. In fact, he was voted one of the most eligible bachelors here in the south of Florida. Well, he's uh, certainly running pretty strong here. He was very good last year. He and his teammate, uh, Zelda Farron, both very, very strong in this series last year. Uh, Going to be a very strong game this year. Buddy Rice, whatever his problem is, they didn't fix it on that pit stop. They went in there to try to try to fix it, but uh, obviously uh, they obviously they didn't get it fixed because they he's really really slow on the racetrack. Well, of course, he joined forces about mid-season last year with Team Cheever. Uh, Cheever will run himself at the Indianapolis 500 that has indicated that he will retire as a driver and continue on in the ownership role of this team. So a couple of active drivers are looking to retire after Indianapolis, both uh, Cheever and Michael Andretti. Uh, Michael Andretti has led the most laps at Indianapolis for any driver who has yet to win the 500. So a lot of fans would like to see him win as he goes out into retirement. Thomas Schechter moved up to sixth position, so he's uh, he's moved up very steadily. Be interesting to see. He was very quick last year, uh, led a lot of laps, but he was always very impatient. He ended up in the fence uh, an awful lot last year, and it led to a lot of uh, uh, criticism on the part of his car owner Eddie Cheever. Yeah, he had a lot of uh, money spent by Eddie. So, so we'll see if he's a little more patient this year and a little more matured. I think that probably is going to be the case. Calls Cape Town, South Africa home, but he lives in a condominium in Indianapolis. And in fact, he made a comment. He's a real health buff. And he says if he's lying on the couch at 1130 at night, he thinks he's wasting time. And I said, Thomas, when you get to be my age, it's good to be on the couch watching television at 1130 at night. Yeah, but he'll actually get up he'll and get go up and work into, out. Yeah, work out that, that late at night. So he's uh, He's a guy that really takes this thing seriously, and uh, he doesn't waste any time, let me tell you. And we know that his mom, Pam, is watching. It's, it's late night on a Sunday evening in Cape Town, South Africa, but she invites all of her relatives and friends over for a party for every race. So a hello to Pam Schechter, uh, Thomas's mom, and his dad is watching. Uh, the former world champion, Jody Schechter, is watching in London, England. Yeah. Boy, right then, Robbie Buell had a big-time wiggle as he started to go to the outside. And it's going to cost him a lot of time as he's dropped behind three or four cars. Got lapped right there. But he was uh, trying to stay on the lead lap and got up there and did a big time wiggle. Jacques Lazier driving back in the cockpit after being knocked out and uh, suffering a head injury at Nazareth last year and lost the second half of the season. But he's back in action for uh, Team Menard. Vitor Mira was their driver of note for the end of the season last year. It looked like he may have had the ride early on, but uh, 
in preseason testing, they gave the nod to Jacques Lazier. Now, Gilles DeFerrin, now your leader. Tony Kanaan has dropped to second spot. So is DeFerrin, another one of those Penske cars, very, very uh, quick. As you can see, he's lapping cars left and right. Looked like uh, Foyt right there that he went around. Foyt is not in his normal green Conseco car. That car, uh, he crashed that car. He got a brand new Delara, and it's not painted. Well, DeFerrin is your leader, the third leader of the afternoon, and they certainly are approaching their pit window right now. He took the lead on lap 47, and uh, we're looking to go 48 to 52 laps. We had those six laps under green, or under yellow, I should say, which means it may move the window up a little bit, but we're looking at uh, some pit stops from our leaders in the next three or four laps. Yeah, I'm surprised that they've uh, stayed out that long. You heard Al Spire say that tire wear was going to be a huge problem in the, all this heat and this very flat racetrack. You know, I thought before now they would be coming in, especially on the first pit stop, but uh, nobody wants to, um, you know, they all want to wait on that yellow, it looks like. Uh, left or left, you see what positions they're running in and how far back of the leader and those drivers are lapped down. Nasakawa and uh, Buell are lapped out, as is Lazier, A.J. Foyt the third, or make that the fourth, is three laps off the pace. Uh, Buddy Rice made that early pit stop, and he is three laps off the race. Leader, uh, Gilda Farron continues to lead over Kanan, and ready back there in the fourth position. Yeah, Kanan, uh, right, been getting a little bit of pressure now. They see DeFerrin, he's going to be pitting before long. They've all got to be pitting. Now, there is Robbie Buell. Now, Robbie was uh, off the pace by a couple of laps. He got lapped. He got messed up down there in turns three and four and lost. Uh, that's when he got lapped, trying to get around the car in front of him. And when he did, he got up in the marbles and all, all the whole lead pack went around him. Well, keep in mind that the Farron finished third in the points championship last year. He was really in the hunt until uh, two races to go, had that concussion, had to set out the last race of the year. And the last race came down to a almost a photo finish between uh, his teammate, Castro Nevitz and Sam Hornish. Sam Hornish won the event, his fifth win of the season, and collected his second straight title. Uh, there had been some speculation, Larry, that DeFerrin might retire after that crash, but uh, has come back strong. And here comes Hornish. Hornish uh, consistently dropping back, but remaining in the top 10 here this afternoon. So he'll come to the attention of uh, the Rocket, Kevin Blanche, and the Pennzoil Panther racing team. Simon Morley, the crew chief. You can hear that sputtering in the engine. That's the rev, rev limiter. That thing uh, helps the, so they don't go too fast down pit road. It's 60 mile an hour speed limit. Hour speed they limit. hit the button. It only let them go 60 mile an hour. So they, that's what you heard. That's the reason it was cutting out. There's the time of the pit stop in the upper left-hand corner. 12 seconds, a good pit stop for the uh, Panther team. So he was the first of the top 10 to make his stop this afternoon. Let's see how that plays out. Yeah, I think Verge off the second corner on the back stretch. Because he was uh, falling back a little bit, I think that's one of the reasons he did go on and make his pit stop. There is Sarah Fisher. Now, Sarah was uh, several laps off the pace. Uh, Sarah has had a couple of podium finishes in the Indy Racing League and in the IndyCar Series. Plus, she had that pole position last year. Well, she ran second at this race, if you remember. So she's had a very good uh, run here, but not today. Well, here's Scott Sharp. Sharp back in the uh, fifth position right now. He pulls up behind Michael Andretti. Castro Nevitz, the top three as you go back on board with Scott Sharp. Thomas Schechter has made his pit stop or is about to make his pit stop. The target Ganassi car hits the mark. And the 22-year-old from Cape Town, South Africa, awaits the service to be completed by the target Ganassi team. And, you and one thing I think that you're going to find that he has learned since last year is the patience. We talked about that uh, yes or earlier. He was fast last year, but he crashed a lot. I think you're going to find a more patient driver this year. And that was Castro Nevis going past Tony Kanaan. So Castro Nevis here at the end of this run seems to be quicker than Kanaan. Now he drops right down to the bottom, and he's going to head for the pit area. So he made that pass, and right away heading for the pit area. So this is uh, the third-place car right now. 
There's the Panasonic entry, Roger Yakasawa. He was uh, he was quick in all the pre-season testing, but did not qualify all that well yesterday. And he, here comes uh, there's DeFerrin. The there's DeFerrin. The Both Penske cars in the pits right now. DeFerrin, your leader, Castro Nevis, who was running in second. Both of them on pit lane. So we'll see. What happens? You can see that it takes them longer to put fuel in than it does to uh, change the tires. If you have a full fuel load, it takes longer to get that fuel in than it does to change the tires. So this will scramble the position slightly as uh, we're making routine pit stops under green. Uh, they're expecting, there's the Hollywood car, the Mo Nunn entry of Felipe Giafoni. Uh, before the race, we talked about a three pit stop race, but you indicated you expect more than that. Well, I expect more than that, but so far, the racing has been so clean. Uh oh, he killed the engine. Stopped he started, the, he started to take out, off. and he was he, stopped. He started to take off. They stopped him because they didn't have the fuel hose out. When they did, they had to go back in and restart it. That cost him 10 or 15 seconds. That's a big mistake. Well, here's the number seven of Michael Andretti who led the first 13 laps of this race here this afternoon. Very calm, cool, and collected as he sits in there. They're making a wing change. You can see right there, that's what they were doing. When you turn those little knobs, you're making a wing change, either more wing or less wing. I would guess today he's probably putting a little more wing in it. Well, he says he is enjoying the uh, business side of owning a racing team. And here comes Tony Kanaan. Another one of the team green cars. And of Seven course, uh, big goal. They had to talk to some other uh, car owners about getting that 7-11 uh, combination for car numbers this year. AJ Foyt gave up the number 11 car, and uh, Al Unser Jr. gave up his number seven, so the the Andretti Green team could have the 7-11 because of that that sponsorship. So Canon. And uh, that was a very good pit stop. All those guys had very good pit stops. As you ride back along with uh, Sam Hornish. <laughs> Riding along with Al Unser Jr. And you saw him uh, take away one of the, the tear offs from the helmet visor. Yeah, he hasn't been a big factor so far. He's running very well, very consistent, but he hasn't been up in that top uh, six or eight guys that have been consistently in the lead pack. Of course, the Penske cars and the Andretti cars have been amongst those top four. Thomas Schechter now is making himself known as he's moved into that group. Well, I'll tell you what, if you could have just held off on that pit stop and made the pit stop under yellow here. Well, I, none, nobody could do that. Unfortunately, there was it was uh, probably 15 laps beyond the real limit of where they should have been. Some of them waited until about lap 55. That's about as long as you're going to go. Well, that's her back in the 11th position right now as DeFerrin leads for the second time this afternoon. We've had four different leaders, Andretti, Kanan, DeFerrin, and Kenny Breck. Kanan has led twice. DeFerrin has led twice. Right now, we're under our second, only the second yellow of the afternoon. Johnny Rutherford out in the pace car. Johnny, the three-time Indianapolis 500 champion in the pace car. Once again, we had some debris reported by the observers on the racetrack, so we go to our second yellow of the afternoon. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what how this all plays out. Some of these guys might come into the pits and make a pit stop, and it looks like they are going to come in and make a pit stop because uh, even though they've only been out there about 20 laps, it will extend their window. Well, I think they're running the entire field on this apron down here because of the debris on the racetrack. Oh, you might be right. I'm not sure they're going in the pits. Are you riding along here, the rev limiter? Yeah. No, obviously, you're right. I thought they were going to take advantage of this and head into the pit area. Obviously, uh, now they're cleaning up the that case. section of uh, turn four, so they took a down access road, the pit lane road. See the yellow there, the flashing yellow light at the start finish line under the flag stand. There's another one right there. You're riding along with the Hollywood car, the Mo Nunn entry for Felipe Giafoni. We understand that Sam Hornish Jr. is coming in. Frank Keedy is also back in the pits. Right, I so thought some of these doing what you thought uh, and had anticipated they might uh, 
and make some stops to top off the fuel. We remain under yellow, and there is the quick stop for fuel for Hornish. Look at the field summaries. We're here in uh, really the uh, not even the middle stages of this race. We've not reached the halfway point. DeFerrin leads over his teammate. Schechter is up to third and ready fourth. Running along with Sam Hornish, who just made a quick pit stop under this yellow to top off the fuel. Frankiti, being shown in ninth position, did the same thing. Yeah, those two guys, they're going to play a little pit stop strategy here, and it may take their advantage. I think Hornish and Frankiti know, both know that they're not running as quick as the guys up in front, the first four or five guys. So maybe if they get off sequence with the pit stops, it'll be to their advantage. They can stay out uh, a little longer and maybe catch a yellow flag when some of these other guys do. We saw this played out last season with the uh, Dansky team. Now they played the uh, pit stop top off the fuel strategy and made some uh, stops out of sequence. There's the number 10 of Thomas Schechter. Schechter had three pole positions last year. The one big win up at uh, Michigan in actually the third car for Cheever. Uh, we have documented it was a very stormy relationship between driver and car owner last year. There were some lawsuits filed and they have since been uh, Tossed out, or yeah, he's uh, you know he's had a, a tough he had a tough year last year. Let's face it, when you step out of a race car in the middle of the season uh, under threats of lawsuits and all sorts of things, you know that things are not going well. The lawsuits but. were eventually dropped, but you know here's a guy that was leading in Indianapolis with like a 10 second lead with 27 laps to go and uh, pushed her up the fence and. Uh, a phenomenal talent, and he's going to win a share of races, but I think he has to learn that patience, and I think he probably would tell you the same thing. There's a look at DeFerrin, who continues to lead the second time this afternoon. Yeah, he's uh, he's done a great job. That old Penske, I mean, whenever you come to an Indy-type race and Penske's there, you've got to consider him the guy to beat. He's proven year after year after year that uh, his teams are, are the guys that are, you know, always tough. And there's Castro Nevis. He's now in third, second place. And you can see that he's got two lapped cars between himself and Castor and uh, Jill DeFerrin. So he's got a little bit of a problem getting around those two lap cars, getting up to his teammate. But right now, at this point in the race, less than halfway mark, I think he's very happy to sit there and run in that uh, se second spot. Well, right now we're hearing from uh, the scoring. We'll have two laps before we turn them loose. There is Thomas Schechter in the uh, target car, presently in third position. All three of those top cars, now Toyota-powered cars with the large chassis. There's Andretti in car number seven, Tony Kanata number 11. Michael Andretti is currently fourth. Yeah, and that's the first Honda-powered car on, on the grid right now. So Andretti running in fourth is the first His Honda teammate Honda right car. behind him with Honda Power. The two green big gulp 7-Eleven cars as we documented uh, the numbers going along with the sponsorship. Green used to be a kind of taboo in the United States as a color of race cars, not anymore. It was considered unlucky. and uh, You would never get Mario Andretti, Michael's dad, to drive a green race car. There's Scott Dixon back in ninth position. So, uh, and there's Scott Sharp. Scott's back in the uh, seventh position. They're still working on the debris. I'm not sure what that debris was, but you can see the safety crew up there uh, on the racetrack coming off the fourth corner at the head of the main straightaway. That's where they're taking the. the yeah, they've been out there the for quite some time. Down to that uh, access road. Sam Hornish currently running back in eighth. He has, he did make a pit stop, so he can go about 15 laps farther than our leaders. So uh, he's in a good position now if things fall right, that he could uh, get up near the front if things went well for him. Well, he won five races last year to defend his championship. And there's a look at uh, Dario Franchitti, who is currently in ninth position. And he's the third team green car. Different sponsor, different color of car, but it is owned. He will be the second uh, team green car after Michael Andretti retires after Indianapolis. They will only run two cars for the rest of the year after that, but right now he's Right the third. now what he is most famous for is who he's married to. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Judd 
Uh, the movie star, the actress, is his wife, and they live, uh, I think they're living down in Tennessee someplace, aren't they? Uh, that's where she's from. I'm not there's sure. Usually, there's usually, well, of course, he's from Skyland, but there's usually the uh, biggest crowd in the pit area is around his pit looking at it, glimpsing for her. We're going to find a glimpse of, uh, of Ashley Judd as we'll go one more lap and then we'll go green. Well, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, Castro Nevis goes after these two lap cars and gets up there and tries to challenge his teammate or if he's going to be content just to run back there in second spot for this next segment of the race. Make it to, uh, you know, lap 100, 105 before they have to make the next pit stop and uh, then do something about it. So they've got another 25, 30 laps before they'll have to make another pit stop unless there's a yellow. But this has been a very lengthy yellow for debris. And we'll see the uh, furl flag. There's an indication from the uh, pace car. One more lap. And so this time by, when they go through three and four, they'll be up on the racetrack. And well, we will turn them loose there from the starter stand. You can see the furl flag. The pace car has pulled off. And once again, the field belongs to Jill DeFerrin. And we, as we noted, the safety crew here with the IRL Indy Racing Car League, uh, it's uh, one of the best in the business. And I'm sure they wanted to make sure that they did their job absolutely perfectly before they got off that racetrack. We'll also keep an eye on uh, young Thomas Schechter and see what he has in mind because he's moved up nicely, qualified in the ninth position, presently running third after the uh, first round of pit stops. There's the restart order with Breck and Unser a lap off the pace. Lazier's a lap off the pace. Takagi is a lap off the pace. The rest of them are running one through six there as they come through the corner, picking up the throttles. They come off. There is the green flag, and we're back to racing. Yeah, you can see right here a lot of those. Look at Hornish. No, that's Scott Sharp back there in that yellow car, way down on the inside, trying to get around some of those lap cars and make some progress. But uh, Castro Nevis stayed in line. He did not make a move as he went uh, into turn number one. Well, there's still a long way to go with at least two, possibly three more pit stops. That's Al Unser Jr., who's actually running right behind him there between he and uh, Andretti. Here comes Scott Sharp on the inside for position. Wow, he was uh, he was really making a move right there. He's got a great restart, and it looks like he's still running extremely well, even one and a half, two laps into this restart segment. On the restart, Schechter lost the position. Michael Andretti has moved to third. Schechter drops to fourth. A little bit surprised to see uh, Kenny Brack down a lap already. He did uh, he did make a late pit stop, and that could have hurt him because he, he stayed on those older, slower tires a lot longer than anybody else. Back up to the front. DeFerrin continues to lead only one lap car now between first and second. That is Kenny Brack the Pioneer. That's the Ray Hall Letterman entry. And you can tell right now with the new tires, he's as fast as Castro Nevis, who's been trying to get around him, hasn't been able to make that move yet. Mike Landretti running back there in the third position right behind Castro Nevis. All three of those cars running about the same speed. Well, there you see Castro Nevis in second. That's the red and white car, the Marlboro entry from Team Penske, then the green and white entry of Michael Landretti. They run second and third. Fourth now is Schecker, then it's Sharp, Kanan, Dixon. Hornish is now eighth. That's about where Hornish has been running through it's much of this race. About where he's been running most of the race. You're exactly right. He's uh, He fell back to sixth right away, lost a couple more spots, and has kind of maintained that position. Remember, he did make a pit stop, though, and he uh, so he's in a pretty good position to you know gain something if he can get his pit stop or a yellow flag just at the right time. Well, there is an indication uh, in the lower left-hand screen that Michael has won here two times under the CART sanction. Uh, Sam Hornish has won the last two races here in the IRL. Well, we have maybe another yellow that uh, we're hearing the number 27. 27 and four actually made contact. The green remains out, but Frankiti and Hornish, Hornish have, made some uh, contact in turn one. So it'll be interesting to see. There we ride along with Sam Hornish 
as he and the Frank back in eighth and ninth position Larry have made a little bit of contact uh, both of them right now seem to be up to speed though as we're taking a look at the timing monitor and they seem to be going all right now some of these cars have two top gears some have three we just saw Sam shift into a higher gear that's because the way the wind blows down here you're never you you have to select the gear before you start the race and you can see him right now he's shifting down when you're going down the front straightaway the wind is blowing at you so it, you can run a little bit lower gear going down the back straightaway you probably have more rpms so you shift into a higher gear so a lot of them the i think the guys that really are leading this race have three top gears now well, so an oval and we're shifting gears you thought you only did it on the road course well there's not Jacques here today Lazier. there's jock lazier in the uh, team menard car but he's way back in 16th position Several laps off the pace right now. And you can see he's having all kinds of trouble. He moved up the racetrack right there and already has lost 10 car lengths. They've had a shuffling of positions within that team. Butch Meyer had been doing all the engines. They elevated him to team manager a couple of years ago and then just relieved him of those duties. So again, some employment shuffling within the team. So there you have your, after 85 laps, the Baron continues to lead his teammate here in Miami. Welcome back. We're in the middle of the Toyota Miami 300, and Jacques Zazia has just got it completely wrong. He's in the wall. We're under our third caution period. And this is exactly why Jacques Lazier, as you can see, has been struggling and handling problems with the car all the way through, gets himself up on the marbles, and the car just will not turn left. Christopher Tate here with me in the studio. Nothing he could do. It was a gentle one, at least. Yeah, that's right. That's a sort of accident that's very easy to happen at uh, Miami because that track is very, very slippy off the line, Keith, and uh, he just had nowhere to go off the line. He's had trouble throughout the race. He's been very slow. This is his first big comeback race. You remember last year about halfway through the IRL season poor old Jacques had a really horrible accident and though they've said he was sort of only concussed in fact he had a lot of problems it's good to see him back racing shame that's the way he had to go out indeed well before we rejoin the action at the Homestead Miami Speedway some great news for British fans from the Infinity Pro Series support race held earlier in the day still Mark Taylor, of course, is the man that did the business for the former British Formula 3 driver, made his debut in the series and pulled off a strong victory ahead of Tiago Medeiros, the Brazilian driver, by a margin of 1.2 seconds. All the drivers are, of course, in identical Delara chassis powered by Nissan Infinity engines and Taylor, driving for the Panther Racing Team, started from the front row of the grid and led for the majority of the race. Here's the top six finishing order with Brandon Irwin finishing third ahead of Ari Leyendijk Jr., Jonathan Erlin and Todd Wood. Well, that's the Infinity Pro Series, and this is the view as far as uh, Jacques Lazier. Um, well, he's not sitting in it anymore, but that's the, the look from his car as he gets dragged out of the wall. We're on our third yellow at the moment. Perhaps a little bit of time here, Christopher Tate, in the mm. studio, to talk about the second yellow. A, a huge ten laps were taken out of the race for, for debris on the track, uh, yeah. which we couldn't quite ascertain. And cynics would say that the race was a little spread out and it's closed up now, but uh, mm, what would you say? Well, yeah, I mean, there was certainly very unusual for a 10-lap yellow to have occurred like that. You know, just as we got this yellow time gap, we were just talking about Mark Taylor winning the junior race this afternoon. I was just thinking, you know, that's the first time that anyone other than Nigel Mansell, a Brit, has won an American series race on his debut. So well done, Mark Taylor. Good effort, eh? But here in the uh, main IRL race, um, we've obviously had a tremendously much closer last few laps after that long yellow and we're still not really clear what all the debris was no well i mean it doesn't matter anymore i suppose it's uh, we're going to be going racing again very very soon as soon as that pace car turns its lights out and moves off down pit lane but de ferron has managed to wedge his way out in the yep. front looks quite dominant at the moment as well it's quite we're a, a great coup for him if he could win this race today yeah i think what's always going to be important in this race keith is if there are more yellows which will inevitably be it's the ability of the honda engines to pull away quickly at the restart <clears throat> and Gilles and indeed the two 711 Andretti green cars as well as um, Elio have been able to just pull away at the drop of the green very quickly and they're going to do it again in a minute. A little bit more of your expert opinion regarding the man we're looking from at the moment Sam Hornish I mean it's not you said you said that um, 
I don't suppose I can repeat what you said off air, but the fact of the matter was you questioned uh, their qualifying uh, performance. That's how they got through to third place. It was only a question you asked me. I, well, I, yeah, I hasten to underline, right. but the fact is that uh, the performance that Sam Hornish and the team are showing now that we've actually got racing conditions is nowhere near the qualifying performance. That that's he right. He, he qualified third, and um, that really did cause a surprise, as we said right at the top of the show. He's really been struggling though this afternoon. Struggling. I think he's now running eighth or so. Yeah, and. Uh, it's really not been an easy afternoon for him. So I guess that uh, we've got to say that um, either some changes have happened between practice and the race in the wrong direction, or perhaps he was particularly fortunate with a strong gust of Miami wind to blow him through qualifying. Well, we did see Sam Hornish and the team winding the wings on that car, on the Panther Racing car, quite considerably during their last stop, their fuel and tyre stop. So obviously the car is not handling anything like he would want it to be. Um, whatever the reason for that is, we have absolutely no idea. Well, just to reiterate, we are at the Toyota, Toyota Indy 300 at Homestead Miami Speedway. It's the opening round of the Indy Racing League Series. We're on our third caution period, thanks to number two, Jacques Lazier, going into the wall. They've removed the truck from him. The pace car is very soon coming in. So let's rejoin our commentators at trackside for the very latest. has a son in, in stock car racing, a grandson in the uh, the IndyCar series, and the yellow remains out as you ride along with Felipe Giafone. Castro Nevitz and his teammate are leading. Castro Nevitz for the uh, first time this afternoon becomes the fifth different leader. Andretti has led. Kanan has led twice. DeFerrin has led a couple times. Breck led for a couple laps, but then made a pit stop and uh, lost a lap somehow. And now Castro Nevitz with the first lead for him this afternoon. We only have uh, two cards out of the race. That would be Lazier and uh, Mayer, both from crashes. But these engines are uh, up to full song, holding up. Not one engine problem so far. Oh, and look at this. Castro Nevitz got a terrible start. And to fair, oh! Almost contact. The teammates almost took each other out. Right away, Castro Nevis knew that he did not get off that corner very well. He headed for the inside to try to block his teammate. Didn't work, though. And, He's doing uh, some blocking right there. Yeah, DeFerrin is. Yeah, DeFerrin uh, got right back down there, so. Schechter's back there in third, and he's going to have something to say maybe on who's going to have second position here shortly. And you can see they moved to the inside. Now, they're warned by Brian Barnhart not to block. They say, if you come off high, stay high. If you come off low, stay low. Well, he saw some blocking right, right in, yeah, in that case. Right that's right. In that case, they moved down the racetrack a little bit. But, uh, you know, on this racetrack, it's a little different than it is at Texas or someplace where you can... You can't stay on the bottom of the racetrack and run these corners that way. You just can't do it. You can't do it in Indianapolis either. Farron Castro Nevitz, teammates. Then it's Schechter. Then it's Andretti. Then Dixon. Oh, look at this. Almost three wide. The target cars are right up there. That's Schechter and Scott Dixon. Man, oh, man. That is really, really risky at a place like this because you just can't run three wide into the corner here. And somebody wisely backed out of the throttle, and I think that was Dixon who moved back there. And Hornish is back there in uh, sixth position, I believe, or is that seventh? He's in sixth position right now in the yellow car. Boy, and you can see that the teammates battling each other very hard right here. Now, in drafting in stock car racing on a big track like Daytona Talladega, there's some advantage of the teammates working together. Now, we didn't see the Yipensky teammates work together earlier because we saw some blocking by DeFerrin. Well, these guys, at this racetrack, track position is very important because once you get in the lead with the one-groove racetrack, which basically this is, it's awfully hard to make that move. So on the restarts, a little slip on the restarts like we just saw could make a huge, huge difference. Well, we've got the youngsters, both the pair of 22-year-olds, Schechter and Scott Dixon, are running back there in the... Uh, Dixon's being shown in sixth position. Uh, he, I think he's in fifth. He's gotten he's around one. There's six right there. You're riding in sixth position right now. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Dixon goes around his teammate. 
That's Scott Dixon. Dixon moves up to what fourth position. Yeah he's moved around. Thomas Schechter moved into fourth position. This is the strongest he's been all day long. And Look after the Hornish. Hornish looks to the inside. Maybe there's a problem with Schechter's number 10. As Hornish moves to fifth, Schechter drops to sixth. Well, every time when you get passed and you have to move up the racetrack, you don't get in the throttle as quick, so you lose the momentum down the whole next straightaway. So I think when he got passed by his teammate, he lost the momentum going down that next straightaway, and that allowed Hornish to make the pass. We'll find out here pretty quickly as he gets back up to full song, but if he... If he does, that's uh, the only thing that happened was he just lost his momentum. Well, just past the halfway point, now some 98 laps to go here at uh, Homestead Miami Speedway in the uh, south of Florida. And of course, in three weeks, we'll take you across the country to the, uh, the desert southwest, Phoenix, Arizona. Then, of course, on uh, April 13th, it's gonna be a long, long air flight for us to uh, Japan. And there you see Scott Sharp has also gotten around Schechter. So Schechter obviously has a problem with either with the handling or with the engine as he's lost a lot of ground here in the, just the last three or four laps. He's from third, third back to uh, sixth position. And here comes Scott. Scott Sharp was the co-champion of the very first IRL season, shared that championship with Buzz Calkins. And now he is on the move trying to close in on Hornish. So he rides in sixth position. Hornish is up to fifth. That's the best he's really been since the start of the race. Yeah, and Scott Dixon and, and uh, Hornish are two of the fastest cars on the racetrack right now. Hornish began the race in third position inside the second row, dropped back to about eighth. And he's been running in eighth position for a long time. Now he's up to fifth as you take a look at the top five after 105 laps of 200 here in Miami. So the Penske teammates continue to show the way here on lap 106. The Farron and Castro Nevitz. And that and pit look stop. back at Scott Sharp. That uh, when Tony Kanaan killed the engine in the pits, it cost him a lot of racetrack position. He's back in eighth spot now, but that is Scott Sharp running in sixth right behind Sam Hornish. He doesn't seem to be gaining a lot on him, but uh, He's very, very strong. One of the strongest cars on the racetrack right now. Well, it's DeFerrin and Castro Nevitz, then Andretti. Dixon Hornish is fifth, then Sharp. Schechter has dropped to seventh, then Tony Kanan is eighth. Ninth is Franchitti, and tenth is Al Unser Jr. We've not talked a lot about Al Unser today. Unser began this race in the 11th position, and that's just about where he's been running. Yeah, he stayed there pretty much all day long. He hasn't been a factor up, up in front the front of the pack but uh, he's been running pretty well but uh, he is the teammate to Scott Sharp and Sharp's car does seem to be handling much better. Well Sam Hornish won five times last year in fact he led the most laps but he's not led here this afternoon now Jill DeFerrin led the second most laps last year Thomas Schechter was third but Sam Hornish at two pole positions and five victories. And one of those victories came right here. In fact, he has won the last two outings here with the uh, Indy Racing League. As we said earlier, the man who's running in third position, Andretti, has won twice here as well. Now, Alan Look at this. Scott Sharp has pulled up right behind, Ooh. pulls to the inside of Hornish. Boy. Had to he, let Sam go that time, though. He got a good run on him, but he had to get out of the throttle. Sam gave him a... Gave him the bottom of the racetrack, but uh, in the end, Sharp didn't think it was worth the risk. Well, this is the battle for fifth position. Again, Scott Sharp closes in ever so slightly on Sam Hornish. You look back off the rear wing, and look how close he is now. Moves to the inside. This could be the pass for position. He has the spot. He picks up the fifth spot, and Hornish drops the sixth. And he's much faster down uh, the front straightaway than he is the back straightaway. So a pass for position as Scott Sharp moves up one spot to fifth, dropping Hornish to sixth. So some of the best action here at the Grand Prix of Miami is not at the top of the field, but it's back in the fifth, sixth positions on the racetrack. As you see, the yellow number four of Hornish, who just got passed for the fifth position. Yeah, Scott Sharp uh, was much quicker down the front straightaway. 
Uh, you just, we see, we've seen him shifting gears, Hornish all along, and look at this. That's Buddy Rice. Rice. Buddy Rice in the Red Bull Team Cheever entry. And that's not exactly where you want to be on the racetrack because this is not the interest of the pit area off the third turn. That was off the first turn. So I'm not sure what the problem is. Well, he had uh, some sort of a problem. I don't know whether, but he was very slow down the front straightaway. I'm not sure whether he missed the pits or whether he had a, some other sort of a problem, but uh, he went in the pit lane in one and two and back up on the racetrack. Look at young Scott Dixon, the road racer from Auckland, New Zealand, pulls up behind the number seven of Andretti. And this is a battle for position. And he's going to take it the first turn. Boy, he certainly did. He made that look easy. Once Andretti got out on the outside, he had to get out of the throttle and just let him go. And all those Kiwis down there in uh, Auckland right now are standing on their feet cheering this young man. Well, of course, the Ganassi target team knows how to win races. They've won championships. They've won races. And so no surprise that they're competitive here today. They've got a couple of young guns, a couple of 22-year-olds in Dixon and Schechter. And look at Scott Sharp. Now he is all over Andretti as Andretti obviously has come up with some sort of a handling problem here in uh, this part of the race. So he's uh, he's slowed down a lot. Scott Sharp, on the other hand, seems to have really picked up some speed. He's really got the handle during this segment of the, uh, the racing. Well, Scott Sharp, as we told you, was the co-champion of the very first in the Racing League series. He shared the title. He drove for A.J. Foyt back then, and he shared the title with Buzz Calkins. Uh, Calkins' team was not able to put a program together and uh, will not apparently be racing at least the first part of this season. They had hoped to have something for Jeff Ward, and that didn't come together. We hope to hear from uh, Jacques Lazier on what exactly happened. Fortune, we had a car that with the setup. It seemed like whenever we came off a yellow or had a heat cycle on tires that the car would come out and be real loose and unfortunately we were just coming to the end of our fuel window the car got underneath me it was a good clean pass but unfortunately the car went a little loose i caught it and then but i was just up in the marbles along for the ride what about the track conditions overall not good mediocre bad I, I think the track conditions were actually pretty good i think more than anything we just missed something. We didn't have a great car. I feel really bad for my team because this is not indicative of what this team is capable of. Well, they'll be back in Phoenix. Well, you saw your leader go on by uh, A.J. Foyt. I think probably young A.J. is doing exactly what the old uh, grandpa wants him to do, keep his nose clean and get some laps in. Yeah, he's moved up on the high side, and he's letting everybody else go around. But... Scott Sharp is really fast down the front straightaway. Well, Scott Sharp may be one of the faster drivers on the racetrack right now, but again, as the Penske guys are leading this race, running one and two, but Sharp is up to fifth as we continue to race 118 laps here at Miami. 118 laps out of 200, you're right along with Scott Sharp. Scott is looking at Michael Andretti. Andretti in that green and white car right in front of him, running back in the uh, fourth position. Scott Sharp occupies fifth. He got a great run. He's going to try to get around him going in there. No, oh, he had to give away. The lap car, Foyt's car, messed him up. He couldn't get low enough to make that pass and make a stick. But that is also right there a good sign of a patient race driver. Yeah. An inexperienced driver going to stick his nose in there with that momentum he had and taking out two cars. Now look how much, look how fast he gets through turns three and four. He's really quick down here, gets off of four really well. And that's where he's making all of his ground because he's got a good race car down in turns three and four. Now once again, this is the battle for fourth position. Scott Dixon is third, Castro Nevitt is second, and DeFerrin continues to lead. DeFerrin has led the most laps in this event. Now keep in mind, there are two bonus points for the driver who leads the most laps. Yeah, and, and Scott Dixon, who's running in third, also is one of the fastest race cars on the racetrack right now. He's really, really been fast during this segment. He got up right behind uh, Castro Nevis a few laps ago and then fell back. But uh, up to that point, he was really giving everybody on the racetrack, he was running faster than anybody, actually. Well, this battle for fourth position is uh, being generated right behind one of the drier Reinbold cars. Go back to the uh, head of the pack. Tony Kanaan is slowly moving his way back up through the field too. As he's uh, 
also one of the quickest cars in the racetrack. After he killed the engine, fell back to ninth, he's back up to seventh. Well, the Penske cars that finished second and third in the points championship just one year ago are now running first and second. There's Castro Nevitz in the number three car. He is second. Scott Dixon in the number nine target Ganassi entry is running in third position. And there is the gap between second and third. There is Scott. And I tell you, we have got some very, very good talent. We talked about the new faces we're going to see this year. Schechter is young. He was here last year. Scott Dixon is young. He's a newcomer. And these guys are going to be very, very competitive. The opening race of the IndyCar Series with the Indy Racing League, the Grand Prix of Miami. We're on lap 124 of the scheduled 200. And you jump back on board with Felipe Giafoni. Giafoni drives the Mo Nunn Hollywood entry. Won a race last year, was a former Rookie of the Year, another of the Brazilian drivers. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's driven a very steady race. He hasn't been uh, one of the guys knocking on the door up front. As you can see again, Scott Sharp battling with Andretti, tried to get around him that time going into turn three. Again, the battle for fourth position. Scott had a run at him earlier, but couldn't quite make it. He's going to make it this time, and that changes the position. As Scott Sharp goes around Michael, Michael drops to fifth. Scott goes to fourth. Well, he's been trying to do make that same move now for about the last 10 laps. Finally had everything work just perfectly for him as he got off a of turn four very quickly and uh, had all the momentum build up. And Andretti, he had no choice. He saw him coming. The only thing he could do was try to block him, and he wasn't going to do that. Too much time left in this race. Well, Scott Sharp, one of the winningest drivers in this series. Yeah, and he is uh, one of the fastest cars on the racetrack right now as he's running uh, over 300 kilometers an hour, 192 miles an hour. Uh, one of the only about four or five cars running that quick at this point. Well, you're right along with Scott Sharp back in that fourth position. Kanan has gotten around Sam Hornish, so he's gained another spot. Uh, very slow but sure back up towards the front. Uh, once again, after that very costly mistake, moving, falling clear back to uh, eighth or ninth spot, back up to sixth position now. Oh, you can hear him really getting out of the throttle right there. That's Sarah Fisher heading out of the pit area. She's not had a good day. She's running back in 16th position, uh, three laps off the pace. Well. Scott Sharp, who rides back there in the fourth position, a seven-time winner in this series. In fact, he's had five pole awards. Won the title, as we said, with uh, A.J. Foyt in the very first season when he shared the title with Buzz Calkins. Take a look at Thomas Schechter, who had three pole positions last year, one at Michigan in the uh, third team car, which came as a really pleasant surprise because uh, Schechter apparently right now has radioed into the uh, Ganassi team that he has a tire pressure problem, so we could see another uh, pit stop out of sequence for Thomas Schechter. So DeFerrin continues to show the way over Castro Nevitz. Dixon now in third, then it's Sharp, Andretti, and Kanan. 129 of 200 laps here in Miami. So this could be a race that's going to be a shootout between the uh, Penske drivers, but uh, hang on because Scott Sharp at L5 Team Kelly entry runs back there in the uh, fourth position. A lot of green racetrack in front of him, though. Yeah, a long, long way up to uh, Scott Dixon, but still he's having a very good run. He's going to be extremely happy with this run. You can tell he's a little bit off on the handling. He's he has to get out of the throttle up in three and four, especially coming off of turn four. But that corner has been a problem for everybody. There's little Al in the pit area in that Corteco car. Uh-oh, he killed the and engine. He stalled the engine. There's a veteran race driver who stalls the engine. Two-time Indy 500 champion. Yeah, that's too bad. Uh, that'll cost him a lot of time under the green flag. Well, Al won 
the 500 his first time with Owen Snyder as his crew chief. Owen then, of course, was the crew chief for Eddie Cheever when he won the 500 back in 98. And uh, Owen had moved over to this new team that they were trying to put together for uh, Jeff Moore, the uh, Buzz Calkins owned team. And it never came together, so Owen's down here looking for employment. Yeah, he's trying to find himself a job, but uh, so far hasn't come up with anything as we take back on board. With the Scott Dixon, and there is another pit stop by Rice. Rice has never been a factor in this event. Buddy in the uh, the Red Bull entry for Team Cheever. Yeah, he's back in 16th spot. He's uh, a couple laps down, too, and he really has not been a factor. A lot of these Chevrolet-powered cars have had uh, big-time trouble. Hornish, uh, who's running in seventh, is the top Chevrolet-powered car. There's nobody else in the top 12. I would really expect, Larry, for all that to change in a couple of races because Chevy's going to do whatever Chevy needs to do to make that engine competitive with the Hondas and the Toyotas. And I would expect by Indianapolis in May that you're going to see Hornish uh, perhaps a little more competitive as you continue right along with Scott Dixon. Grand Prix of Miami, the opening race of the Indy Racing League IndyCar Series that will include 16 stops and the first uh, venue outside the continental United States as we'll take that long airplane ride to Japan in uh, April. And there you saw Dixon. He also shifted gears down there between turns three and four. So the wind is a, a big problem for these guys. He's shifted gears. He's going to get in traffic, probably thinking he needs a little bit lower gear with uh, with the traffic in front of him. Now his cowling looks to be more all-encompassing than the cowling on the the Ford car with Sam Hornish, because we easily saw Sam make that gear shift, which we can't see all that well with with Scott Dixon. Well, they're both the large. You can make some changes in those body styles. Most of them are identical, though. And there you see, there's a little. Well, we understand now from timing and scoring that Castro Nevitz has been warned on his radio about blocking. Now, that has been a very, very high profile uh, problem and that has been addressed by the IRL officials. Brian Barnhart has warned these drivers in the driver's meeting they will not allow, not tolerate blocking. Right, and there you see Scott Dixon. He's getting around the lap car. Scott Sharp now has to get around him, but probably it was Dixon who was up there that Castro Nevis was uh, trying to move down the racetrack to block. And you're right, Brian Barnhart is not going to tolerate that. If they give him one warning, the second time it's going to be a penalty. It'll probably be a stop and go penalty, so he does not want that to happen. Well, there was some argument last year that Castro Nevitz had been blocking at some tracks, and also Felipe Giafone in that race that he won was accused of blocking, and Brian said, we're not going to tolerate this. Now, they've been very strict on that because there was a lot of that uh, two or three years ago. There was a lot of blocking going on, and there were some crashes that was, that was caused because of the blocking. So they said, we're not, oh, look at this, Dixon makes the pass. Well, if you can't block, you're going to get passed, right? So Scott Dixon goes to second position, and he sets sail for the other Penske team car as DeFerrin continues to lead, and we have to be getting into that pit stop window. Yeah, we're, they're going to have to be making a pit stop before too much longer, but Scott Dixon is the fastest car on the racetrack right now. He is really, really picking them up and laying them down. Tony Kanan is the other guy back there. He's, he, fall, he fell way back on that pit stop, but he's really running quick on the racetrack right now and catching the leaders. Now there's the leader right there with one lap car between first and second. That's the A.J. Foyt car, the A.J. Foyt the fourth between Jill DeFerrin and Scott Dixon, 140 of 200 laps in the book here in Miami. Welcome back for round one of the Indy Racing League and right on cue while we're away on a break Robbie Buell was the man that hit the wall this is what happened having already hit the wall he's spinning off into the infield area we can tell you Robbie Buell is perfectly okay but the 24 car certainly isn't Christopher Tate, um, I have to say that we had a lot to talk about in that last segment because we've got a race at last. It uh, certainly looks as if it was a little stagnant for a while, but we've got Scott Dixon splitting the two uh, 
uh, Penske cars. Uh, Gilles de Ferran now is the next one under attack. Helio Kestrenev is down in third place, and then Robbie Buell breaks up the momentum. Yeah, that's a shame, that, isn't it? And particularly because young Kiwi, uh, Scott Dixon, in the G-Force, going <laughs> extremely well. I mean, he really was um, running beautifully. And to get in between the two Penskes today, who you must admit, overall, must look as though they're going for a win here, was impressive. He's, he's doing well. And now all the momentum's a little broken up by Robbie's accident. But Been a lot of to-in and fro-in through this race. Uh, in this yeah. last section, we've had a situation where Scott Sharp suddenly found a lot of momentum. What do you put that down to? This track still cleaning up? There's only one groove we've heard from the commentators, and certainly it looks like if you get out of that groove, you're going to go into the wall. Well, I think there are two or three factors. I think uh, the first thing is that none of the teams, with all new chassis and uh, really a whole new set of regulations, are too sure yet about tyre wear and what's going to happen. And you'll see some cars' performance degrading much quicker than others as they come to the end of a spell. Now, under this yellow, we're probably going to see a lot of people do a pit stop, so maybe things will change again. But I think tyres have been quite a big factor. The other factor has been the ability of the Hondas to get away quickly at the restart. And the third is that the Miami is a very extraordinary place weather-wise and people are losing um, two miles an hour on lap speeds just because of gusts of winds on, on the backstretch in particular. So um, a lot of different factors coming into play. But thank heavens, it looks as though the last quarter of the race is going to really get back up. Because we were running a little static earlier on. We certainly were. We can't repeat what was being said here in the studio. But certainly <laughs> after our build-up at the beginning, we were a little bit disappointed. Well, we're under our fourth yellow. This is what happened. Robbie Buell was the man that found himself sliding uphill. Oh, dear me. Yep, Actually, he lost that himself. on the transition, though, from, from coming off the banking Ooh. onto the flat. Actually, he kissed it quite gently, considering how fast they're going there, Christopher. Yes, yeah, he did, and he seems to have just done that all by himself. Now, you've got to wonder that something odd was happening, because he was right in the groove and not offline on the marbles. As we've seen, Homestead Miami really is very much a one-groove track, but he actually smacked the wall hard, and he was... Uh, very lucky to avoid that Andretti green car. Here well, we are back on board. We are indeed Chip's car, Chip Ganassi team car. A bit of a clean up going there with the visor being slung out. These are live pictures from the Toyota Indy 300 at Homestead Miami Speedway. Larry Rice and Gary Lee are, are our commentators at Trackside. We're just about to be coming off of our fourth yellow caution period of the afternoon and the race really is becoming quite strong indeed. Gilles de Farron leads, Scott Dixon in the Chip Ganassi car is in second place and Helio Castroneves in the other Penske car is third. And as I say, fourth yellow. Let's get back to the track now though and hear what our commentators have to say live. How many laps is he down? He is two laps down so that that early pit stop has cost him one lap. And they've made a pit stop. These leaders made a pit stop not only under yellow, but about three or four laps after Sam, which puts them in a better position fuel mileage wise than does Sam. As they go down the back stretch, still under yellow here in Miami. Opening race of the IndyCar Series, Gary Lee, Larry Rice with all the live action. We're coming to you live from Miami Homestead Speedway as you ride along with the leader on the restart, Scott Dixon, the rookie, the 22-year-old from Auckland, New Zealand, will be your leader. There is DeFerrin running in second, then Castro, Nevin, Sharp, Kanan, Andretti. Schechter is back in seventh, then Frankiti, Nakagi, Giafoni, and Hornish now two laps off the pace. Yeah. He'll get one back. He'll get one back, actually. He's, one, he's only one lap off, but he's right in front of the leaders. He'll get a go around and tag. The first eight cars are on the lead lap. Torek Takagi is the first lapped car, first car one lap down. So he and uh, uh, Giafoni are one lap down. Hornish is one lap down. Uh, Kenny Brack is one lap down. Allen's a junior one lap down. Everybody else uh, down farther than that. Well, we've had six different leaders this afternoon. Kanan has led a couple of times. DeFerrin has led a couple of times. We've had Andretti, Kanan, DeFerrin, Breck, Castro Nevitz, and now Scott Dixon, the six different drivers to lead this race. There are no bonus points for leading the race, only two bonus points for leading the most laps, and right now that would be Jill DeFerrin. Right, and Tony Kanan, it'll be very interesting to see who's quick. Every time you put on a new set of tires, every set of tires reacts differently. So you never are quite sure. You can do everything identical. You can put on the same stagger. You can make them all identical. But no two sets of tires are absolutely identical. 
and sometimes you get a, what we call a bad set of tires. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them, but maybe the stagger's a little bit off, or the you know something is different about that set of tires than the last set, and it can either help you or hurt you depending on uh, on what happens. Well, there's a look at Jill DeFerrin. He's currently in second position. He has led the most laps here. Tony Kanan is after that uh, disastrous pit stop has moved his way back up to fifth spot. So he's uh, he's back in the hunt, especially with this yellow. He'll be right behind your leaders. There's your third place car, Castro Nevis. Foyt is going to let those guys go. He doesn't want in the middle of this mess, and I don't blame him. He's going to follow the tail. Well, also we see a safety crew outside turn four at the head of the main straightaway. So apparently some debris on the racetrack not associated with the uh, crash scene. Once again, we're under yellow for a Robbie Buell crash in the Purex car, but he climbed out uninjured. I think all these cars will be able to make it to the end now. They've run enough yellow flag laps. There's 49 laps to the end, and they've run enough yellow flags that they can all go to the end without another pit stop. It'll be interesting to see if there is another yellow, what the strategy will be, how much the tires are going to make a difference. See how wide open this cockpit is right here where his hands are? And it's closed in. This fairing that you see up here by the side of his head on the Scott Dixon car actually flares in more toward the steering wheel than it does on these other cars. So you're riding with Scott Sharp. Sharp back there in the fourth position for this restart, but your leader is young Scott Dixon. We have gone three quarters of the way in this event. So 48 laps to go. Scott Sharp will restart in the fourth position. But your leader will be Scott Dixon in the Chip Ganassi target entry. Well, I tell you what, you take a look at the new teams that have come over to run this series. Uh, they're talking about the best fields ever in, in the type of the talent of drivers, the crews, the cars. And, and this is going to be a series that's totally up for grabs. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, there's uh, there are so many good teams, so many good drivers, so many good uh, crews. It's going to be a very difficult series to win. And it's going to be, you know, you can go to any race now, and you've got uh, 10 or 11 potential winners. And not that you didn't have last year, but it just seems like the, it, the quality of the teams is up just that much. Well, wait till Indianapolis when some of these teams that have uh, two cars in the race haul out the backup and bring in some other drivers. As now the lap cars or the cars that were directly behind the pace car have been uh, allowed to go on around to rejoin the field at the back of the pack. And there's a look at that Corvette pace car. Yeah, that's the rule they started last year. And I think it's a good rule. You want the leaders at the front of the pack on a restart. Uh, a lot of crashes caused when they were trying to lap those uh, slower cars, and I think it's a good rule. They also have another new rule this year where the driver has to be able to get out of the car in five seconds, and uh, that's pretty tough. There's a lot of gear on you in there, and you've got to get out of there very quickly. <laughs> That'll eliminate some of the old race drivers, yeah, right? That's right. <laughs> climb out. Well, we've got a youngster leading. You see the two Penske cars running there in uh, second and third position with Scott Sharp back in the fourth. There is your lead car as the pace car pulls off. We are about to go back to green flag racing in the Grand Prix of Miami. Scott Dixon, the 22-year-old from Auckland, New Zealand. Well, the Kiwis, of course, lost the America's Cup here recently, so this would certainly give them something to cheer about in the sports world if Scott Dixon could pull off a win here in his first IndyCar well, Series race. Into spring here in the Northern Hemisphere, our, our racing buddies in Auckland are heading into the fall of the year. So they go from the racing season to the rugby season down there at uh, Western Spring Speedway in Auckland. All right, they're all lined up single file as that parade works off the corner, and there is the green flag. We're back to racing as they complete lap 155. Scott Dixon did a great job. He got a good start. He, sometimes the veteran, look at Scott Sharp. He's down to the inside, and he gets around Cass. Oh, no. Not yet. Not yet. He didn't almost contact in turn one. He lost some I think RPMs. there was contact. I was think there? there was contact. Well, he loses a position. He lost the momentum with or without contact, and he lost a position. Yeah, he certainly did. I believe that was Kanan. Hard to tell those two cars apart, but I think that was uh, Kanan who got around him. 
Well, so you got the Ganassi team out in front. The Penske guys are running second and third. It'll be interesting to hear Scott Sharp's take on that because uh, during that, when he came in there, I think Castanevas came down the racetrack and uh, barely touched him, and Scott Sharp had to get out of the throttle, and when he did, he lost the spot. Well, Robbie Buell brought out the last yellow with that crash, and momentarily we'll hear from uh, the driver. Driver of the Dryer Reinbold team, sponsored by Purex. Robbie. Well, actually, we're pretty happy with our race car relative to things, but in traffic up there, it was real loose. Uh, we had our sticker tires on. That was our time to make up ground, and uh, it went one time. I thought it had it, got another time, so uh, not what we wanted, but we had an okay race car. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks. Robbie Buell talking to uh, Jack Root back in the uh, infield area after being checked out. Despite the fact he climbed out on his own, he went to the infield care center to uh, have that mandatory checkup. Back to the action. And again, fourth place does belong to Tony Kanaan. Scott Sharp back to fifth. Michael Andretti is sixth. Yeah, and it, they've settled into a pretty good pace right now. And uh, Scott Dixon very comfortable out in that lead, uh, running a little bit quicker than anybody else on the racetrack right now. Tony Kanaan is the guy that appears to be uh, the biggest threat because he has been the fastest guy on the racetrack for the last uh, few laps. Well, keep in mind, Tony Kanaan, had it not been for that bad pit stop, would likely be leading this race right now. Yeah, he and Scott Sharp actually had the two quickest times on the racetrack last time. So the guys running in fourth and fifth were the fastest two cars around the racetrack last time around. And Scott Sharp has been very, very quick also um, for most of this race, especially the last half of it. Well, Scott Dixon. Continues to lead this thing in the uh, Toyota-powered entry. That's a G-Force chassis, and we only have five of those chassis in the race. Yeah, these, uh, he looks extremely strong right now. Again, from a road racing background down in New Zealand, he's come up here, he's, uh, he's run ovals a, uh, you know, a lot with cart, but it isn't his specialty, but he certainly has been strong here today. And it appeared that as the race went along, he just got faster and faster. They made the adjustments during the pit stops, and every time he came back on the racetrack, he's been very quick. Well, he's showing patience, and we've talked about this before. One of the toughest things for a young driver to learn is patience. If you're fast, if you're competitive, you want it, and you want it right now. He is showing some discipline, some maturity. He almost let the race kind of come back to him. Yeah, exactly, and, and he did a great job of that. He didn't, uh, he didn't, you know, panic. He didn't do anything silly. He just uh, struggled along and did get to the lead eventually. And, and that's what you have to do in this series. There are so many good cars. You can't panic. You can't, can't try to make everything happen all at once. But look at this. The first five cars all within about a half a straightaway of each other. Well, Schechter is back in seventh position. I think he is the last driver on the lead lap in seventh. Dixon continues to lead. You see 37 laps to go, but that will also include well, maybe a pit stop, maybe not. With that long yellow, they should be able to go the distance now. But you take a look at Sam Hornish, he'll have to stop, I would guess, one more time because he's been uh, he's been pitting early. Yeah, he, he might have to stop. He, uh, he may be one of those that has to come in. But the first seven or eight guys, the guys that are right now in contention for the lead, are not going to have to stop. And, uh, you know, they're all in pretty good shape. Others on board with Scott Sharp back in the uh, fifth position. And as you said earlier, a couple laps ago, Tony Kanaan and Scott Sharp were the two fastest drivers. Now, it's one thing to turn in a fast lap. It's something else to close in and get around somebody. Yeah, it is. And, and right now, nobody seems to be, have anything at all for Scott Dixon. Scott Dixon just every lap pulls away to a tenth of a second, a half a tenth um, more of a lead from everybody. Look at uh, Scott Sharp, though, back there in fifth. He is gaining on Tony Kanaan. So the best battle on the racetrack is not up in front, but for fourth position between Tony Kanaan and Scott Sharp. Kanaan in the Honda-powered Delora. Scott Sharp has the Toyota-powered Delora. And there you're riding back with uh, Sam Hornish, presently in 11th position. So 
He's had some uh, pit stops that, that have cost him the last because he made it under green. Then the yellow came out. But for some reason, uh, that team has been making early pit stops this afternoon. We'll watch that next time when we get to Phoenix if that continues. Well, I, I think uh, before Phoenix, Chevrolet is going to come out with some new engines. I know they're working on a new set of heads uh, for this engine. I think they'll probably have them available before Phoenix. They, they definitely they know they're a little bit behind the game. They know they've got to do make some changes to the engine. They just uh, they just realized it a little too late. But it may not just be a case of horsepower, Larry. But he is he's pitting early, which indicates to me that the the fuel mileage is not as good. Well, and that's a big factor. They they can't just add horsepower. Uh, usually, when you add horsepower, you take away from fuel mileage, so it might be a big factor. Oh, look at oh, this! Oh, Scott Sharp had the front end wash out on him, and he had to backpedal out of that thing. He to did keep the, it off the wall. He did the same thing coming off of turn four, so that's one of the reasons he's lost so much ground. He was gaining on Tony Kanaan. Now, all of a sudden, he's uh, moving backwards a little bit, and I think it's all because of that big push he's got uh, down there in the corner. Was he overdriving it? I, I don't think so. I think it's, you know, the cars just sometimes do that. He might make a little bit of a sway bar adjustment, something that which he can do inside the car. You can see again, he's having a little bit of a problem down there in the same place on the corner. That's the same shifting. I was looking to see if he was shifting like we saw Hornish earlier. I didn't notice that he was. I don't know. I, I don't there, think I haven't I seen it he is. Off the corner. He didn't shift there. Talking to his team as he hits that button on the steering wheel. No, he's not shifting. He's a very calm and cool. Look at this, though. He's closing in, though. Well, that's because he was held up. Is that Foyt again? The lap cars make a huge difference. If he can get around this car before he gets to the corner, yeah, it's Foyt again. He's uh, several laps down at this point. But that allowed him to close in on Tony Kanaan a bit. Yes, it did. Uh, and Kanaan was being very cautious. He didn't try to make any pass. He got caught Foyt as he was entering turn one. He was very cautious and he didn't try to do anything silly. He just stayed right there and followed him through the corner. Oh boy, he's right up on the edge very, of that groove. Very high though. He's running very high either on purpose or uh, the car is pushing off the corner. Yeah, I just don't think he's got a choice. The car started to push on him and he just gets up there. He has to kind of ride it out. Well, we go back now to 10th position. Sam Hornish has moved up one spot. Uh, Sam will not uh, three-peat here. He's won the last two outings, but it won't happen for him today as you look back from the rear of car number 21, the Giafoni entry back to uh, Hornish. Well, now they're showing Hornish again in 11th position, and apparently the uh, 21 car in 10th. Now you can see Sam Hornish. Uh, uh oh, you can hear him right there. He had to get out of the throttle once again. He got a little bit loose there. You can hear him get out of the throttle turn, just jerk the wheel a little bit, trying to keep that thing underneath him. Right now, as you're looking at this uh, battle for position back in the pack, your leader, Scott Dixon, enjoying a two second margin over the Penske cars of DeFerrin and Castro Nevitz. Yeah, he's chasing Giafoni, and he's a little quicker than Giafoni, but. Uh, just can't find a way to get around him. I, I don't think I don't think it's all the engine. I don't think that car is handling as well as it did here last year. Last year we saw him run up in the high groove. He he could pass cars on the high side. This time he's running up there, but he's not uh, not making the passes like he has did last year. Well, again he tucks in behind Giafoni. Well, now he closes in on him. I was going to say, just as I said that, he moved to the high side. Oh, did you see that wiggle coming off the corner, though? He was that on looks the to high be side. in front of him in the other target car. So he's uh, he's trying all the places on the racetrack, trying to make uh, make that race car go a little faster, but so far hasn't done it. Yeah, Schechter seems to be having some problems as he slowed down. There goes Giafoni, has a look to the inside, and motors by. But keep in mind, Hornish is still a lap off the pace. Yeah, they're still a lap off the pace, both of them. So, uh, you know, even though they got around him, they didn't really gain a position right there. So as we look into the last few laps of this event, they're showing Sam now in the 10th position. As Dixon continues that two-second advantage over to Farron, then Castro Nevitz. Good on. Sharp and Andretti. So Andretti from the front row back to seventh position right now as you continue to ride along with the uh, number four 
Now that lead has increased to two and a half seconds. Castro Nevis now almost four seconds behind back in third position. Sam Hornish uh, struggling a little bit here in his uh, first race of the year. Trying to come back, or he trying to come back and win his third consecutive championship, and he's just not nearly as strong as he had hoped here today. Well, 22 laps to go, and I tell you what, these 22 laps are going to be tough for that young Scott Dixon because he's got a couple of veterans behind him, and he's probably talking to himself right now. Well, he's he is talking to himself, and he's saying, "Man, this seems way too easy right at the moment. I hope nothing changes in the last 22 laps." And I'm sure at the same time, both Castro Nevis and DeFerrin are talking to their pit guys saying, what can we do? What do we need to do? And I bet you they're hoping for a yellow because they want to come in and make some changes to the car. Well, sometimes for a young driver, Larry, it's easier to be chasing somebody than to be chased because right now Scott Dixon's out in front. It'd be very easy for him to lose the rhythm and make a mistake because he is being pressured by two Penske drivers. Well, that's right. He, he's uh, but he's a he is a veteran. He's only 22 years old, but he's proven before that he can drive these cars. He's with a great team that has a lot of experience. Chip Ganassi doesn't put anything on the racetrack that's not top shelf. So he has really uh, done a great job here. And I know that he's the one guy on the racetrack right now that's hoping that he does not get a yellow flag. He's very happy the way things are going. He went by Hattori there in the Epson car. That's the other A.J. Foyt car. We documented earlier that uh, Hattori actually brought the uh, funding for that car, and he's going to run through Indianapolis, and then that car will be turned over to uh, Ayrton Dare. So Dixon continues to lead it now just under a three-second margin over Jill DeFerrin. And just uh, four seconds over third place, Castro Nevitz. And there is Hornish oh. trying to get by the number 10 of Schechter. He moves to the inside. And look at that. He had a run on him. Horsepower showed right there. He did not have enough horsepower. He had a run on Schechter and could not, did not have enough momentum down that straightaway to make the pass. I think that was clearly the fact that the Chevrolet did not have the horsepower that the Toyota had. Schechter in the uh, Toyota-powered target entry for Chip Ganassi, the Chevrolet power plant for the Penzo Panther team. And you can hear that engine at full song before he backs out of it in the corner and gets back on the throttle. Yeah, he's... Uh, he's, he's, not on, he's not on the rev limiter. No, he's doing everything he can do, but, uh, you know, he, it's just not going to be his day. He's going to have a, a tough time and he's not going to be one of the guys contending for the lead when it's all over with. And you can imagine right now he is a very, very unhappy driver in that cockpit. Yeah, he is. He wants to be contending for the lead, not running back in 10th or 11th position. We've got 16 laps to go, and you ride with your leader. Scott Dixon. Did not qualify all that spectacularly yesterday. He started from the 12th position, but worked his way up. And as we said, kind of let the race come back to him. That car got better and faster and more competitive as the afternoon uh, progressed. And now he's going to pull up in a couple of laps on a whole gaggle of cars down this front straightaway. And that could allow DeFerrin to close in on him. So traffic, you talked about tire wear and fuel being an issue. It could be traffic. Yeah, it might be. You can see right, this traffic is going to be a huge, make a big difference. He's got to get through this traffic if he wants to stay in front of these guys. This is where the experience may either help or hurt him. Well, a good spot to collect the traffic. It's coming off the corner, passing down the straightaway, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, he does get by him. That was Al Unser, Jr. Goes uh, another lap down. He's two laps now off the pace. But look at him fight that steering wheel, Larry. Oh, yeah. He gets on the button, talks to the crew on the radio. Off the throttle ever so gently. Back in the throttle, comes off that fourth corner, only six degree banking on the turn, three degree banking down the straightaway. If nothing else, that helps the straightaway drain should it rain. 
Boy, he's making this look so easy right at the moment. And believe me, uh, when a car's handling that good, he probably is having as good a time out there as anybody. Those guys that are chasing him are having a heck of a time trying to figure out what they can do to catch him. There's Kanat in fourth position. His teammate Michael Andretti back in sixth as you run through the field there, the upper left of your screen. And the uh, type of uh, power plants these guys have behind them. The only thing that uh, DeFerrin can hope for right now is that uh, your leader catches some traffic in the final 10 laps and he well, has a shot at it. Look how much he's closed in on him right now. He's uh, he's caught him big time as they've gotten into this uh, into this traffic. So Scott Dixon has got to get through this traffic, get get a couple of lap cars between himself and DeFerrin. Oh, look at this. Moving down to let him go? I don't know, boy, that that's Breck. A... That was Kenny Breck, and look at that. That's not exactly where DeFerrin wanted him to move back up in front of him. Yeah, DeFerrin, he moved down to the racetrack. Most of these guys are moving high and letting him go around. Breck moved to the bottom, and uh, sometimes that's not what those guys expected, but it did give Scott Dixon a little bit of a break. But you know that Scott Dixon checked the side view mirrors, and he saw that he was closing in on him. Yeah, and he was... Uh, he was very happy that that happened. Now then, he's got two more cars. Oh, he caught them just at the wrong time. He's going to have to follow them through the corner. That's not a good thing. That's going to give DeFerrin a chance to catch him. And you can see he got out of the throttle, and he cost himself. He probably won't even catch him before he gets to the next corner. He's not All going right, to. let's see what happens. Oh, well, now DeFerrin is really closing in on him. This is, this is where the uh, veterans versus the rookies might make a huge difference. DeFerrin really closing the gap. Nine laps to go, nine laps to go. And Larry, we talked about how traffic will play into this. And that's the story right now. Look at the traffic out in front of young Scott Dixon. Here comes the veteran, Jill DeFerrin, right behind him. He's closed down in traffic. I believe that's Tor Takagi right in front of him that he's trying to get around. Eight so. laps to go now. Eight laps to go. Well, there's a big break. That's he got break. around that, to that, Takagi. Yes. Now then, if Takagi lets uh, DeFerrin around the next lap, that'll help. But if he holds him up for a couple laps, it'll be a huge, huge help. No, he's going to let uh, DeFerrin go right away. So right there, DeFerrin got a break because Takagi held up Dixon and did not hold him up. So uh, C.J. Foyt again, he's going to go by here. Looks like the Foyt car with seven laps to go. He's going to catch him and go on by. Yeah, so right that, now, right now, Scott is catching these guys at the right spot on the racetrack. Yeah, he, he got a big break there that he got around Foyt going into that corner. The Ferrans, I think Foyt's going to get up and out of the way and let DeFerrin go. Maybe not. DeFerrin didn't get close enough to make him do that that time. So uh, that's a big, another big break. With this few laps to go, DeFerrin's really going to have to get his act together in a hurry. Six laps to go. Six laps to go now for Scott Dixon. Well, unless a major disaster happens, young Scott Dixon is going to come home with his first victory and make Chip Ganassi look like a hero for hiring him and bringing him into this series because he is really the last half of this race, the last 60 or 70 laps, he has been one of the fastest cars on the racetrack. And DeFerrin has yet to dispatch with young AJ. Yeah, DeFerrin's gotten around him. That's Castro Nevis back that's there. That's Castro Nevis, yeah. yeah. Uh, DeFerrin has gotten around him, so he's right behind him. But those guys are really, uh, you know, they've really got their work cut out. As well as Dixon is running, uh, it's going to be tough. Unless five he runs. laps to go, just over five, just under five laps, we should say. Now we're coming up on four laps to go. They do have a lap car in front of them, so uh, this could be a big benefit. I think the Farron is running a little quicker on the racetrack right now. He seems to be an open racetrack. He's chasing him down, but just very, very slightly, and uh, he's not chasing him down enough to get around him. Well, there's one more lap car to deal with before they get the white flag. But here comes the Farron closing in. He is faster, he is quicker, he is catching him ever so slightly. And you see on the monitor, three laps to go. You look back from your leader to second place. So Scott Sharp 
Toyota Power. Leading Toyota Power. Oh, something was that? What was that? It came off the car or was it something was kicked up? Yeah, Scott Dixon leading, not Scott Sharp. Scott Dixon, yes. And now then you see that he is also, he's put another car between him. So it's, these guys are really, no, he hasn't. I thought oh, he'd he gotten around no, him. So no. he's still behind that Two lap laps car. to go. We'll look for the white flag the next time by. And you know that Jill DeFerrin is pedaling that race car as hard as he can. Here he comes. Look at this, six tenths of a second. He's cut it down four tenths of a second in the last lap. So he is really picking him up. But man, oh man, no time left. Well, we've come to expect these tight, close finishes. One lap to go. He's not going to be able to put this other car a lap down. So what can Jill DeFerrin do in the final one and a half miles? Well, right there, it looked like he cut about three car lengths. Now, just that he's running out of time. I don't think he's got enough time. Scott Dixon is going to be the winner unless something really bad happens here in the next corner and a half. Off the corner, Scott Dixon, the 22-year-old, going to take the checkered flag and pick up his first ever IndyCar Series win. The Grand Prix of Miami as Jill DeFerrin goes second. Less than a second separating first and second. That's what we have come to expect here in the Indy Racing League. Tony, Tony Kanaan worked his way back up to fourth spot after uh, that bad pit stop. Scott Sharp, who is very quick until the last part of this last segment, uh, ends up in fifth. Well. Welcome back, and it's Toyota's first season in the IRL. It was the Toyota Indy 300, and of course, with Dixon winning in a Toyota with a G-Force chassis, Christopher Tate is absolutely ecstatic. Yep, well, I think that's probably fair, Keith. I mean, I do think that's a tremendous performance, yet regardless of the G-Force angle for a minute. A great run by young Scott. This is his first run in the IRL. Yes, he's a proven driver from the Champ Car Series, but these cars are different, and that was a good effort. We saw how hard Dario Franchitti found it, sadly, that this weekend. Scott's driven a great race. He's held off the might of the Penske team. Indeed. Who've um, impressed. The Honda engines have impressed, and yet the Toyota's won the race. But really, honestly, it's a very exciting moment for everyone in the G-Force camp, you can be sure. Not just for the target Chip Ganassi team, we were the first people to decide to run with a new G-Force chassis, so good for them. But really for everyone who's been involved, all the suppliers, everyone, it's been a long, hard winter. And uh, all around the Elan group, you can be sure there'll be well, a few be bottles being cracked You can open. be sure that every team has been working that hard oh. this year with the rule changes and the chassis changes as well. But I've got to say, Scott Dixon, having qualified down in 12th place, were you at any time before we came on air confident that he and the team could actually pull up the trees that they have done here? Well, obviously, Keith, coming to the studio this evening, I was uh, talking to a number of the guys trackside, and um, it is the case that uh, no is the answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you for a long, protracted <laughs> answer to that. No, one. but really, um, all these tracks are quite different. I mean, what looks to um, uh, the audience, you know, an oval is an oval. There are all sorts of different ovals, and Homestead is just a very, very difficult track to get right. Let's talk about the, the Toyota Honda domination as it is at this moment mm. in time. I mean, Chevrolet mm. did okay in qualifying. We don't know why, but really yeah. Chevy have got a lot of work to do, haven't they? Yeah, they certainly have. It looked um, originally in the first tests of the year at the beginning of February as though they were down about 40, 50 brake horsepower because, you know, remember, they're all in different... Uh, chassis as well so you can make a straight engine comparison and it was obvious they got a lot of work to do quite where Hornish's speed came from qualifying we don't know Chevrolet got a long way to go to get this thing back up there Hornish 10th today well you can be sure they'll be working on that Scott Dixon is in victory lane now and we can hear from the man himself this 22 year old youngster from Lachlan what a great way to come into the IRL it was lovely I couldn't believe it the car was just so so great uh, we struggled a little at the rear but in the middle of the race we were very strong Paul, he may be one for understatement, but he's got a big smile on his face today. Well, you can see confirmation of the result there. I have to say that it's not just a result for Toyota and G-Force, also one for New Zealand as well. Scott Dixon, not one for a little while, and uh, he's New Zealand's best racer since, uh, well, 
for well, as many years I can remember. Yes, we start making ourselves feel old, Keith, and start talking about Chris Amon and Denny Hume and people. Yeah, no, it's a tremendous result. Um, he worked very hard to make his way up through American racing, didn't go the conventional route for a Kiwi racer coming to Europe and so on. And um, he's really done a great job. He's a, he's a right little star. He's going to be good. And um, with two young kids in the Ganassi camp, him teammates with Schechter, um, you can expect to see there's going to be a quite a lot of on-track rivalry yes, this year between those two teammates. Okay, what have we got to... You've, we've had the first round now, you've been right. looking in depth right the way back down the field through yeah. qualifying and through the race. What have we got to look forward to for the rest of this season right now? Who, who are going to be the people that are emerging? Well, all sorts of things. I mean, not just people, tracks as well, of course. Um, in two races' time, we're off to Mategi in Japan for the first ever visit by the IRL outside the United States. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Honda own track. Certainly, Honda will be looking for a win, at least from the Penske team there. Um, the G-Force car will be quick at the longer tracks, and we get to the two-and-a-half-milers, and Indianapolis itself, come May, is going to be fascinating. In fact, they fly back in from Mategi straight into all the endless month of May at Indianapolis but between the drivers so many quick young boys around there I mean I can't believe that Chevrolet aren't going to do something about power for Hornish and indeed for all the other Chevy drivers and um, he is on a two championship role let's not forget but now the competition has got serious with the arrival of all these cars out of champ car with drivers of the quality of Frank Kitty and Andretti and Canaan and so on it's going to get tough the competition is just going to get tougher and tougher it's going to be a great season for the IRL. It's a great uh, start to the season in the end. A bit of a slow start, but uh, congratulations to Scott Dixon and, of course, the G-Force team. It all continues in just three weeks' time, and we'll be bringing you that race again on Sky Sports Extra. The date for your diary is Sunday, March the 23rd. The race is the Purex Dial Indy 200 from the Phoenix International Raceway in Arizona. Well, we hope you can join us then. In the meantime, my thanks, of course, to Christopher Tate and, of course, to you for watching. We'll leave you with some of the highlights from today's action from the Homestead Miami Speedway. It's good night from us here on Sky Sports.